folks and, uh, and welcome back to Turbo Productions. Uh, it's been a while since I put a video up here but um, I, I read uh, Sir Geoffrey de Havilland's biography and it, it really inspired me to make a, make a little video on him because um, well, he's a pretty amazing guy and I think I think you'll all agree once we go through this. I can't, uh, can't for, there's no way we can talk about his life in, in, a, in a little video that would be be several hours long. The guy, the guy really, um, well, achieved so much in 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 one one little lifetime, and his legacy lives on in so many ways. Um, so, what what we'll do instead is just go through the uh, just go through his records, and 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 even that's I've got to say, he made so many aircraft and so many uh, breakthroughs that weren't necessarily. Um, you know, counted might have been world first and might have been major developments, but weren't world records. Um, but either way, we'll, we'll just we'll just have a look at the records because I think that that pretty much illustrates the point that perhaps he was one of the most important men in aviation. Like, um, well, at all really. Uh, you think of how you, how you like, I suppose. The the Elon Musk of his day, perhaps. Uh, I'd say he <laughs> he achieved probably more than Elon has so far, but. Um, I'll let you be the judge of that anyway. <laughs> so, um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey built his own plane around about the same time as the, the Wright brothers had, uh, had just achieved their first powered flight. And everyone knows the Wright brothers. And I almost, they, they achieved notoriety because, um, because they were salesmen. They didn't even, it's a, it's a myth that they achieved the first powered flight. Yeah, um, their first power flight was slightly more successful than the previous ones. Uh, however, um, they're in the history books more than anyone else because they were because they were salesmen basically. And um, Mr. Mr. De Havilland, Jeffrey De Havilland's first flights were very much more successful. He did crash and, and nearly kill himself. Uh, he rebuilt his aircraft and um, was doing circuits in it. And, and soon after that, he was uh, selling planes to. <laughs> To the army or the Royal Air, Royal Air Corps, as it, it was in those days, um, it was part of the army. But either way, the first um, first first record of his came in 1916 with the uh, construction of the DH-4, which was a, a single-engined um, bomber, and it was the fastest bomber. And there were 9,000 built. 1919, uh, first regular international services, and this was in a DH-4A, so. <laughs> Pretty much the same aircraft, just uh, converted for passenger use. Uh, 1925, world's most popular private aircraft, the um, incredibly beautiful DH-60 Moth. Yeah, I, I worked on one of them at college. Pretty cool. Um, and yeah, they were very popular. And succeeded by um, the DH-82 Tiger Moth, which was the world's leading primary trainer. So. Um, Certainly, I, I know the uh, the Harvard in the States has the 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 label as being the pilot maker. You know, it's uh, America's uh, America's training aircraft, which is uh, you know quite a quite a chunky beast to be learning to fly an airplane in. But the um, the Tiger Moth was certainly what any Commonwealth pilot or any any overseas pilot learning to train in, in learning training to fly in a Commonwealth country would have been flying, in, and probably a lot of. Uh, a lot of overseas air forces were using as well. Um, so a little uh, little biplane with the uh, inverted the Havilland engine. I mean, I'll, I'll add he was making his own engines at this point. You know the the the, the, um, the gypsies the Havilland gypsy engine, which is, went on to be a very successful engine, was um, basically the Tiger Moth, and, and that was um, I believe it's, it did start off as a Renault V8 engine, um, the right way up. You know, and then somehow Jeffrey Dowland um, split it to an inline four, and um, and the early certainly the Moths had a um, had a stand-up engine, and then the 
um, Tiger Moths, the, the engine was adapted to uh, dry sump and um, inverted in line uh, in order to, to get a bit more prop clearance. It, it makes a lot of sense to do that in an aircraft, you know, there's a lot of problems associated with it, but either way. <laughs> okay, so that was 1931, world's leading primary trainer. 1934, England, England Australia Air Race winner, the DH88 Comet, okay. So everyone's heard of the, the Havilland Comet, but this is the... Um, this is not the jet airliner, this is the twin-engined um, to the Havilland Gypsy 6 Majors, I believe. Uh, beautiful, beautiful aircraft. Uh, and that was that was designed purely for, for winning races in the what a lot of people consider to be the golden age of aviation. You know, lots, lots of uh, air races going on, like the Schneider Cup that um, famously birthed the Spitfire. Um, and, uh, and this was the, the Australia Cup, I believe. No, is that, a, is that a sailing race? Either way, England, Australia, air race. Then 1940s, uh, 1940, world's first shell production process with the de Havilland Mosquito. So that was um, very in interesting construction, you know. It was nicknamed the Wooden Wonder, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, but that was um, essentially a cold layout plywood construction. So you'd get um, sheets of veneer and uh, run them off into strips, you'd have uh, maybe, maybe six inch wide strips and take these strips over a mould and, uh, and then lay another opposing diagonal um, strip of veneers and you can, you can take a three dimensional shape that way um, you know, and once you've built up um, five, six, seven, eight plies you've got a very strong fuselage um, with, with very little internal structure so it's probably as close as you can get to a monocoque structure with just, uh, with just wood in 1941, World War II fastest bomber, 7,000 built, again DH-98 Mosquito. Um, and 1943, World War II fastest propeller fighter, DH-103 Hornet. And this is actually one of the aircraft I hadn't heard of, so um, didn't see a lot of um, didn't see a lot of action. Um, but uh, 470 miles an hour, yep, the fastest propeller fighter. It's basically like a, a miniature, a miniature mosquito. You know, much smaller fuselage, still with two massive Merlin engines stuck on each wing. Um, sorry, one on each wing. Um, anyway, 1943 again, world's first 500 mile an hour jet fighter, um, DH-100 Vampire, and that had the, the Howland Goblin. Um, Jet engine, so you know that's that's incredible. Not just was he building the the fastest jet fighter, but also the engine that powered it. Um, 1944, world's first propeller twin deck landing, and that goes to a um, DH-98 Mosquito, and that that um that piqued my interest a little bit because obviously we all know that um, the, the Doolittle raids had, had taken off in, in B-25 Mitchells and attacked uh, Tokyo early on in the world in the Pacific um, but yeah, they, they, none of those poor buggers ever made it back to the ship did they? so, um, so yeah, the first, the first propeller twin deck landing goes to a Mosquito um, 1945, world's first jet deck landing so um, that was a vampire that had been adapted and, and landed on HMS Ocean. Um, again, the vampire with um, Mr. De Havilland's goblin engine. 1946, world's first bonded primary metal structure. The uh, slightly awkward looking De Havilland 104 Dove. Um, Dove was a, a pair of aircraft, one of a pair of aircraft. There's a Dove and the get the other one balls okay I'm not, I'm not reading that off the book but there's another one there's basically a, a twin and a four engine and they both had um, uh, a heron the Havilland heron so uh, I believe the dove was the was the twin engine and the, the heron was the four engine very similar looking aircraft but one the, the four engine was obviously a lot bigger and um, these ended up being more popular in Australia for um, for bush work you know that's when the flying doctors got started I believe the the um, Dove was their, their first aircraft, to be honest. I might, might be wrong on that, but they certainly used them, certainly used them in the bush out there. And they again had the, um, the Havilland 
gypsies. Um, although I think the twin engine might have had the gypsy queens, the majors, the um, not the gypsy major. Gypsy major was four cylinder. I worked on those, <laughs> and the gypsy uh, gypsy queen was the the big six. Um, either way. Okay, 1948. This work is really interesting. Um, world's first supersonic jet. Yeah, and and this is what I find absolutely amazing because the the Americans had only beaten um, the Havilland to the to the sound barrier with the Bell X5, and uh, I'm sure you'll know, but the, the X5 was dropped from a um, B29 Super Fortress and burnt its rocket. Had um had a finite burn and then had to glide back down to the airfield and land on a skid. Yeah, so obviously completely useless, no practical application at all. In this time, the government, our government in England, had completely dropped any aspirations for supersonic flight. They just thought, let the Americans deal with it, let them fund it and all the rest. Jeffrey de Havilland privately though, which is one of the reasons I've got so much respect for him. I mean, it doesn't say in here, like the, a lot of these, a lot of these endeavors, a lot of these records are entirely private endeavors. Um, either way, um, just after the Americans broke the sand barrier in the X5, uh, Jeffrey de Havilland and he managed to achieve the first supersonic jet with conventional takeoff and landing. So um, while the Americans were still messing around with the X5, uh, dropping it off a of B 29s, Jeffrey de Havilland was taking off, uh, reaching altitude, um, going supersonic, and then coming down under power and landing properly on its own undercarriage, which I think is a a true testament to um, to the company's company's skill at solving problems and um, being the first, I suppose. Anyway, 1949 saw the world's first jet airliner, the slightly ill-fated DH-106 Comet One. Uh, 1949 also saw the world's first airliner with powered controls, also the the Comet One, and 1952 saw the world's first public transport jet engine. So 1952 is when the Comet actually entered service. It was always powered by well, the Comet ones were always powered by the um, by the, the Havilland Ghost 50. Although um, obviously it only claimed the the title of the first public transport jet engine after it entered service and started ferrying passengers around. So you know. One aircraft, two amazing feats for the same company. Um, 1952, world's first 7,000 horsepower contra-rotating propellers. Okay, <laughs> let's not forget here that not just was Jeffrey de Havilland making aircraft, airframes, uh, he was making the engines and he was making the propellers. And, you know, a lot of people are going to look at a propeller and say, you know, it's just a, just a bit of metal spinning around. But they are the most highly stressed component on an aircraft, yeah? And, and certainly the, the propellers um, Jeffrey was making were, were variable pitch, fixed pitch as well, but, but variable pitch, which is um, many times more complex than a, than a still highly stressed fixed pitch. Um, 7,000 7, horsepower as well, contra-rotation. I didn't actually see, what was it? Oh, for the, for the Saunders Road Princess flying boat. That was, um, again, another ill-fated project. Um, what a shame. 1952 world's first jetliner services. Okay, obviously the Comet again with British Overseas Airways Corporation. 1954 world's first homing air to air missile. What an achievement! So, not, not just was he building planes, but he was uh, figuring out how to shoot them out of the sky as well. And that goes to the De Havilland fire streak. Um, that was one of the things I, I I didn't have a clue about before I read this book. But anyway, um, 1954 again. Uh, world's 1954 is a good year for De Havilland. Uh, world's first 600 mile an hour shipborne radar to jet. I think that means twin jets, as in two jet engines. Radar two. Anyway, that is the the H110 C Vixen. There's still one of these flying um, under red ball colours. It, it's on the air show circuits in the UK. Uh, looks looks pretty good in red ball colours. I'll try and find a picture of that one. Stick it up. Um, C Vixen's um, twin boom aircraft, so it's a it's an unusual machine all round. But 
but I don't really know much more about it other than that. 1956, world's first turbo pump boost of a main rocket, the de Havilland Spectre. I believe that was for the um, either the British space program or the European space program that we as a country joined um, with the French. But yeah, rocket pumps as well, turbo boost pumps. So um, that's that's basically a uh, a impeller pump that's driven by a turbine and the turbine is powered by bleed fuel from the uh, from the from the high pressure fuel is, is bled off and then burnt um, with the oxidizer that's also got a similar pump and uh, you know the, the the product goes over the turbine driving the um, driving the, the, the turbo pump if you like it's almost like a mini jet engine, but um, 1957, world's first electric grid wind turbine, and that's uh, more specifically the Havilland propellers again. So, uh, yeah, another another incredible feat. We've got wind turbines all over the place, and I never knew again before reading this book that Jeffrey the Havilland had actually been the been the first to uh, to build one. 1958, world's first transatlantic jet airliner. Again with British Overseas Air, Airways Corporation, and that goes to the Comet Four. So this is the much later Comet. Yeah, by this point we'd have all the um, all the crashes of the Comet One and Two, and uh, they'd fixed the problems and uh, installed. I believe they were Rolls Royce engines in the Comet Four, and it was a, a much better machine. But still, unfortunately, um, all the problems that had been associated with the first ones, all the all the first non safety critical problems such as the the maintenance issues of, of working on um, engines embedded in the in the wing route um, they were they were all still there and stayed with the aircraft forever um, in its other forms as well as the Nimrod and that was that was one of the one of the things that meant it could never really compete with um, the more traditionally designed although I suppose at the time that the Comet was the traditional design but um, there's a reason the engines hang underneath wings on nacelles because it makes it very convenient to work on them. And, and back in those days, the turbines needed a lot more work than they do today. 1960, Europe's first heavy space rocket launcher. Mm, that, it calls it the um, DH Blue Streak. And... I'd always thought the Blue Streak was a uh, standoff missile system. Uh, from what I understand of this, it was it was using the the, um, the standard standoff missile system as a as a launch vehicle, so the second stage rocket booster for a, for a payload. 1962, world's first trijet airliner. The DH-121 Trident. 1962 again, world's fastest jetliner, 600 mile an hour, DH-121 Trident. 1962, Europe's first business jet, DH-125. Nineteen sixty five world's first passenger auto landings DH one two one Trident nineteen seventy two China's first jetliner fleet DH one two one Trident right and so those of you that know about aircraft but might be um might be getting a bit excited at the minute thinking that's a Hawker Sidley um, Hawker Sidley gave a separate bid for these these projects yeah so. Uh, the 121 was a, a BOAC contract put out and um, DH put their put their proposal forwards and Hawker Sidley put their proposal forwards and Avro put their proposal forwards the Havilands won uh, however at this point uh, Jeffrey had stepped back from um, from managing the business from managing the aircraft manufacturing and uh, the Havilland was purchased by Hawker Sidley or merged with Hawker Sidley if you want and um, and so as far as anyone else is concerned it's always been called the HS 
1T1 or the HS1T5 or the Hawker Sidley Trident is what I'd always known it as. But, um, same with the 1T5, I mean that went on to be an incredibly successful business jet, it was a de Havilland design. The very interesting about China's first jetliner fleet as well, I hadn't appreciated that uh, so early as well, 1972, I thought they were all still flying around in um, knock-off sock with camels at that point. Okay, and now, and now here's the sketchy bit, and a lot of people are going to argue about this, but um, Airbus wing design and manufacture by DH and successor companies, so uh, this book is, is claiming that um, perhaps the manufacturing, the, the, the wing design team at Havilland obviously became part of Hawker Sidley and then part of BAC, British, British Aircraft Corporation, and then, uh, what did that become, BAE? It's BAE now. I'm, I'm sure there's something else in between as well, but either way. Um, and as, as a result, they are still responsible to this day for the design and manufacture of Airbus wings. So, um, yeah, I didn't appreciate that all the wings were designed in the UK, but they, they are, in fact. Uh, you know, right up to the A400M, the, the big military transport. Cats messing around with the camera, I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, uh, this, this book is alleging that, um, that the de Havilland design team were responsible for everything from the A300, A310, A320, A330, A340, A350, A380 and A400M wing designs and manufacture. Yeah, pretty cool. So there's one little, um, one little caveat I missed out there. The world's first passenger auto landings. And these, these had been performed before, but... Um, Nothing had been certified for Category 3 fog. Yep, uh, and that actually is um, marked down here as BAE. So maybe BAE had, had purchased, um, or BAE was responsible for BEA. Sorry, that's British European Airways. Well, I mean, that's not BAE. It does get confusing with, um, with British aircraft companies because, as you can see, the BEA um, is. Uh, it was originally British Overseas Airways Corporation, that became BEA, and then BEA became BA, British Airways. Um, but also, I think um, Gatwick Airport is managed by a company that's still called BEA, um, and that's a very similar name to BAE, uh, so it gets you, gets you gets your mind going anyway. So that was that was just the quickest possible overview of the of the records that um Jeffrey de Havilland is responsible for. And we've got to remember here that he began his flying at the very beginning, way before the First World War. Um you know, in an aircraft he had to build himself and Um, lived from 1882 to, to 1965 and yeah incredible incredible man incredible man I really I really do think um, that he deserves one of the top spots um, for some of those achievements as well especially the one that the one that strikes me is the uh, is the is the first supersonic jet to take off and land under its own power um, and it was it was not just the first supersonic jet to take on land under its own power, but it was the first supersonic jet as well. Because, like I say, uh, the Americans were still um, still breaking the sound barrier with the X five, which was a, a rocket powered machine. So, um, I mean, just for that, anyone else would be remembered forever and and talked and praised about. But it's it's almost like he was responsible for so much that people just expected it of <laughs> him. No. Does that sound silly? I don't know. I, I don't know why why history doesn't remember him more as, as the truly, truly important man of aviation that he was. Anyway, I hope you all found that interesting. I've, I've certainly learned a lot from this book and uh, hopefully you've learned a lot too. Okay, goodbye.